Mayor, as you will see. So what you're going to learn about today is who the National Civilian Community Corps is and what we do. Um, let me start out by introducing myself again, since you didn't hear it the first time around. I am Jennifer Manhoff. I'm an Assistant Program Director in the Southwest region. I work in the states of Colorado, Arizona, and Arkansas. We have all of our nine states, I'll go over that on the next slide, covered by two more. There's three of us assistant program directors. So what we're going to do today is talk about um, the kind of work that our NCCC teams can engage in. You'll learn about our mission and how that directly relates to the work that we're doing. Um, we'll give some examples of past projects and potential projects that uh, you may be thinking about. We're really fortunate to be joined by two project sponsors who have hosted teams recently in the past. You'll get to hear from Elizabeth Ferguson, who is the Community Engagement Manager for Habitat for Humanity of the Greater Teton, and to Tommy Lester Edward, who is the Regional Director at University of Missouri Extension, who hosted a VitaTech project. And then we'll take a look at the request for applications, how you apply for a team, the service timeline, give you some tips for a successful application as well as successful projects, and answer any questions that you may have about hosting teams or projects that you are thinking about. We have Lindsay Pettit on the line as well. She's going to be answering questions as they pop up in this Q&A section. She is an assistant program director for the states of Oklahoma, Texas, and Wyoming. So feel free to those questions come up for you, and she'll do her best to field those. So this is what it looks like, um, our regional uh, campus in the southwest, as well as our other regions. Like I said, we're a nine-state region. We are headquartered in Aurora, Colorado, and that is very close to Denver, Colorado. If you happen to be attending from another region or you have counterparts in the other regions, we are happy to connect you to the people that can help with any projects um, in those regions, so please feel free to reach out. All right, so here's our mission. Um, we like to keep it simple. We do two things. We do them one way. So we strengthen communities and develop leaders through direct team-based national and community service. AmeriCorps NCCC is team-based service. You'll get to learn more about that. The communities that we strengthen are the communities that you represent and the projects that you put together. And the leaders that we're developing are those young core members and team leaders that are serving on our program. We'll get to learn more about them throughout this presentation. So here's just a little slide about who can apply um, if you're representing a nonprofit, including faith-based organizations, federal, state, and local governments. We've had townships and cities apply. Public schools, colleges, and universities, and tribal governments all qualify to apply for NCCC. Of course, if you ever have any questions about that, you are free to reach out to any of the assistant program directors, and we can help you figure out if you qualify for a team. So I'm just going to go through our focus areas. Today we're focusing on economic opportunity. But we also serve in the areas of education, disaster, environment, healthy futures, and we also serve the population of veteran and military families. But today we are here to focus specifically on economic opportunity projects. And so those projects um, include Affordable housing, which we know best through Habitat for Humanity, but other programs that work in affordable housing also fall into this category. VITA tax programs, um, Main Street programs that happen across the United States, uh, working on building up Main Streets and the economic opportunity for small towns. And we also serve towns and town councils. And so some examples of those projects are, of course, building the homes, 
helping with the community facilities, doing some free tax preparation and community re revitalization, which falls largely under the mainstream program as we've seen some of those go through. And of course, um, it's only limited by your creativity and what your community needs to get done. So let's talk a little bit about who our members are. So as I said, it's team-based service. AmeriCorps and C sends out teams of 10 to 12 members that are 18 to 24 years in age to serve on the projects that you develop. They apply to the program from across the United States and our territories. Um, our recruitment happens nationally out of DC, and they can apply to serve with any of the regional campuses. They represent a wide variety of socioeconomic, cultural, geographic, and educational backgrounds. They have varying education levels, so they can be coming right out of high school and doing a gap year. They can be coming right out of college and doing a gap year, or they could be anywhere in between. Um, you know, just kind of figuring out what they want to do. It's a great experience for them to get a variety of experiences serving on the project. So throughout their service, they serve on three to five projects, and they ser can serve in three to five states on those projects. And the projects, as we looked at our focus areas, they could be serving in any one of those and a variety of those focus areas. So really gaining a broad level of experience. Once they complete their term of service, which is 10 months, they are awarded an education award, which is the same amount as a Pell Grant. It's a little over six dollars to be used towards their education. They can use it to pay off loans. They can use it to go to school. It does not have to be a traditional four-year college. They can also use it um, in a trade school. Throughout the program, they are fully supported. We are a um, residential program on our campus. They come for training. They stay with us when we send them out. They stay with the sponsors. They come back to campus. They have a food allowance. They have a laundry allowance. Um, so all of their core necessary expenses are covered. And the great thing about these people that come and serve with us is that they are generally idealists, and they are going out to dedicate themselves to national and community service for 10 months. So generally, we get a pretty great crew of young people in here that end up being really inspiring for the towns and communities that they serve in. So here is what you get when you apply for a team. You get a team leader. We'll talk about that a little bit on the next slide. They all travel in a 15-passenger van. Sometimes they come with another support vehicle, which is a pickup truck. They all are required to be in uniform at all times while they are serving. So while they're serving on your project site, they will be in there and you will see uniform. And they also come with their own personal protective equipment the food and laundry budget, and workers' compensation, and liability coverage. So when we talk about the team leader, the team leader does not have an age limit. Uh, they apply and are specifically interviewed for the position of team leader. Um, each team leader travels and works and lives with the team, and they serve as the primary liaison between NCCC and the sponsoring organization while the project is in implementation. So this is an amazing position. Um, gives so much experience for team leaders because they are really responsible for the management of the team in all aspects. Their duties include administrative responsibilities, reporting back to campus, um, to have their weekly check-in with their unit leader, which is like their boss on campus. They are in charge of all of the logistical planning for the team, so getting them where they need to be on time, understanding the project, making sure that the team is on time to the, on time to the project site, and any changes that may be happening. 
they're managing all of the members, and some of the members have specific responsibilities as well, and that team leader is managing all of that and all of the reporting requirements that go along with having a team. And so it's a pretty big position, um, and they're learning a lot through it, and they're definitely um, supported here from us on campus and then again by our sponsors. They go through three weeks of team leader training and before the core arrives on campus. So they train for three weeks, and then the core arrives on campus, and they assist us with the core member training for an additional three weeks before they head out into the field on their first projects. So here is what we ask of our sponsors when you are applying for a team. So what's important um, for our sponsors to provide is the orientation to the organization, project, and community, as well as the training, initial and ongoing because what you're getting is a team of generalists. So we are providing the workforce to get the job done, but we ask our sponsors to provide the training and the tools and supplies to get the work done, as well as a minimum of 20 hours of worksite supervision to prevent work stoppage and to make sure that the team knows what is expected to them and um, to answer any questions that may come up while they're on that project site. Again, like I said, the project materials, the tools and supplies, uh, the biggest ask that we ask of our sponsors is housing, and we'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide because that is always the one that seems to stump our sponsors when they're thinking about hosting a team. And then our, what we say is our um, largest ask, or the, one of the most beneficial things that you can provide for the team when you have them is the context for the work that they are doing. Because the team is intrinsically motivated, however, they also are extremely motivated by understanding the impact of the projects that they are working on. It may not always be um, immediately evident what the impact of a project is, so we ask our sponsors to always be reminding them and helping to explain the mission of your organization and then how the work that they are um, contributing impacts the community where they're working. So let's take a, a little look at housing. So housing can take many different forms. When we say housing, um, people think about housing in the traditional sense. But really, we deploy our teams with cots and sleeping bags and kitchen kits, and they can set those up just about anywhere. Um, we've had them stay in YMCA camps, um, cabins, lodges, and dorms, cabins on state forest land, but we've also had them stay in vacant homes, churches, community centers, YMCAs. Um, it's really what they need is a safe place to stay, um, where they can set up their cots and they have access to a kitchen because they're going to be cooking all of their meals and packing their lunch every day, and where they also have access um, to showers and laundry. That doesn't mean that it has to be um, all within that same place because some churches, you know, they're not going to have shower facilities available or laundry. They come with a laundry budget so they can go out to a laundromat. As far as showers go, we've seen many partnerships where communities will request gym memberships or a YMCA membership for the team so that they can use the showers at those places. So what we encourage our project sponsors to do is go into the community to look for housing because generally the team is benefiting the community where they're serving. They are not just benefiting the organization where they're serving, because as sponsoring organizations, our sponsoring organizations are serving the communities. So we look at it as a big community benefit when the team comes into town. And generally, if you can talk to your board of directors or have another forum where you can talk about the, the team that could potentially be coming into your town, the work that we'll be doing, and the need for housing and what that can look like, you may see some hands go up in the air and some ideas to host them. 
not only are they getting all the work done, but I think what you'll hear about from our sponsors as well is just the presence of the team. We hear so many positive things about them when they come into town, how they just bring life into the town and how um, it, for our sponsors it instills a sense of hope in the future of um, the youth from today because these people are out there dedicating their time to service. So. Uh, there's a lot of benefits that go beyond the project site to hosting a team. So now we're going to uh, take a look at uh, a project up close. And we're going to have Shatomi Lester Edward, the Regional Director at University of Missouri Extension, present about her experience hosting teams in their FIDA tax program. So Shatomi, I am going to let you take it from here. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. As Jennifer mentioned, my name is Shatomi Lester Edwards, and I am with the University of Missouri Extension. And basically what that means is um, we are an extension of the university. So all of the research that is done on campus, we extend it out to our communities. And I'm explaining that to you all because um, what one of our areas of focus is uh, financial education, workforce development, business development. And we look to um, figure out the capacity, the sustainability, and uh, the community aspect, and how we can continue to grow. So when we looked at how we how could we go how could we grow, um, we looked at um, really the concept of a change agent. And uh, one of the first things that came to mind was our AmeriCorps in Triple C teams. Um, I, we have been hosting AmeriCorps in Triple C teams um, for for many years now, and um, they definitely provided that change. And so, as you see on on the screen here, change is to make or become different. And we needed to figure out what we needed to do from a program perspective to impact our community from a different stance um, and taking a different approach. So we had to alter, transform, and give a different uh, position as it relates to some of the programs that we, were in, that we were implementing. And a part of that is obviously the agent portion, which is where um, our NCCC teams came in. So producing something. Um, what does that look like? What was the cause and effect? Um, to the type of programming that we were implemented. So, uh, implementing. So as Jennifer stated, we focused on uh, the VITA program. VITA stands for Volunteer Income Tax Assistance. And um, with this particular program, we have many partners that we work with. And you'll see different thought bubbles. I'll focus on um, all these little areas of focus uh, very quickly. Um, so you can have an idea from a sponsor standpoint of the thought process and the things that um, we go through when we're bringing on an NCCC team. So of course we had to communicate the why, uh, the community focus. Why are we doing this? And please keep in mind it's twofold. So while um, the NCCC teams are coming to help the community, we are also providing knowledge um, and, and various aspects for the team of 10, 12, or whomever, how many ever is a part of that team to make sure that they also get the learning, um, the learning needs that they need to kind of pursue better. So um, pursue their focus, if you will. So what, what I mean by that is, is with the team, as you all can imagine, taxes touch everyone. So they are also learning a lifelong skill. So while they are also providing a free service for um, our community, they are also learning a skill as well. The focus area, um, again, is the volunteer income tax assistance. They are exposed to not only uh, knowledge areas as it relates to taxes, but they're also, because we are a higher educational institution, they are also exposed to um, who we are as the University of Missouri. Um, is, is do they want to proceed higher education after um, they have completed the course or the um, program within C? And again, going back to that uh, sponsor and the expectation, as Jennifer mentioned before, we are responsible for housing, and we're also responsible for communicating and reporting. Housing is um, was a struggle, a little bit of a struggle when we first started because um, you have to um, make sure that they do have safe housing. 
they have access to, um, you know, basic needs. So um, basic needs, water, um, you know, grocery stores, and a laundromat. So what we did was is we partnered with a real estate agent, and she had a couple of vacant houses. So um, the first thing that we do is we go and we view the housing to make sure that it is sufficient and um, prep it and get it ready for the students. Um, as Again, as Jennifer stated, they do provide cots and um, kitchen kits. So it really does help as far as you, you do not have to have a fully fur furnished house or if it is a community center or what have you because there's other resources that the team comes along with. Constant communication is also very important because um, you're, you're dealing with a particular demographic and, and segment. They are coming in, like, like Jennifer said, as a workforce, boots on the ground, um, ready to go. However, we, need, we as sponsors need to make sure that we are in constant communication so they clearly understand the why, the focus area of the project what they will be doing, and if they have questions along the way, it's important for us or someone selected on your team to be that resource. And in addition um, to the administrative um, portion of what NCCC is responsible for, we also have a reporting um, aspect that we want to make sure that they have access to. So uh, one thing I did not include is getting them acquainted with your organization as well as the community. It's very important that they understand what's going on within your community when they start that project because they will also be responsible for getting out into the community in addition to your project that they will be working on. Training, the way that we set up training is uh, focused, we primarily focused on two weeks of of, of training where it's kind of classroom administered, if you will. And so we're teaching them about taxes, we're teaching them about the organization, and we're teaching them about the community. The last week is true hands-on. Uh, the sponsor host works with the team so uh, they clearly understand expectations, what to expect, and just what their day will look like through their sense of time that they will be with you. And then again, what's in it for them? Um, the skills that you all are providing is very valuable because they carry that on with them even outside of the program. So don't think that whatever it is that you're implementing is too small or too minimum or um, because you all do it in your day-to-day -day work, um, you, you may not think much of it, but it is definitely a skill that they will be uh, focusing on from day to day. So those focus areas, the whys, the exposure, the sponsor expectations, training with them, those are the things that I really focused on when we brought teams on year over year. Their responsibility, so but it's, it's, again, it's two-way. It's uh, not only their responsibility, but our responsibility is to help them understand capacity building, why are we doing what we're doing, the, the sustainability plan. Um, it's important as the sponsors to not maybe solely rely on the NCCC, but also utilize the NCCC team as once they leave, then what? What are you going to do? So um, really outlining that plan, the do's, the don'ts, the acts, um, and the, the checking in on them after the program is, um, is complete. Their motivation, um, self-motivated sometimes, you know, day to day, being stuck in the house with the same people, it can, it can get old. So it can, uh, if you at all can provide some uh, weekly or, or even some motivational e events for them um, where they can um, either work together and or even have some alone time, that's always helpful. Um, as you all can imagine, when you're when you're with someone 24/7, um, you, you know sometimes you need a break. <laughs> um, and understanding the diversity aspect of it, leadership aspect of it, and the innovation. So again, when we go back to um, the administration uh, standpoint, these are the types of reports that I would provide to the team on a weekly basis. Of course. Uh, your program or project might be completely different, but this, this, these particular reports help 
the team as well as campus, their campus, and even our sponsors, what we're doing, uh, help them understand the impact. So not only will you see on this particular report to 2011 versus 2018 how they continue to grow the program, um, I, I have to highlight that uh, having an NCCC team is awesome. They do put forth the effort. They want to make sure that your program is a success. And as you see from 2011, when we initially started the program to 2018, we grew the program substantially. But also, outside of the growth, also think and keep in mind the types of reports and the types of data that you will provide to them so they understand the impact of the program. And um, finally, it's, it's really being the change that you want to see. What, uh, going back to everything that um, we talked about, Jennifer talked about, and what was just presented, it's really what do you want to see and how will you mold, mold that for the NCCC team. That's great. Thanks so much, Tomi. Yeah. Um, just just all the participants know, um, if you have questions for Tomi, you're welcome to enter those into the Q&A as well, and uh, she can answer those there. So if you have any project-specific questions about what it looks like to have a VITA tax project, um, please feel free to ask those questions. So now we're just going to roll right into our next project and sponsor presenter. Um, Elizabeth Ferguson from Community and is a community engagement manager at Habitat for Humanity in the Greater Tetons, and she'll talk about the project that they had building home with the team. So Elizabeth, I am going to turn it over to you. Awesome. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, as Jennifer said, I am Elizabeth Ferguson, and I am with Habitat for Humanity of the Greater Teton Area, or as we say, Teton Habitat, because that is a mouthful. And I am a host site manager for our AmeriCorps National Service members, which we get through Habitat for Humanity International, and also the project sponsor for our AmeriCorps NCCC teams. Um, since I've been with Habitat, I have hosted three NCCC teams. Um, Wyoming is one of those interesting states that no one can quite figure out where we belong. So we were in the Pacific region, and now we're in the Southwest region, which we're super excited about. So we've had two teams from the Pacific region and one from the Southwest region, and we just submitted our application to apply for another team to come and help us out on our current project, which is 24 Habitat homes over the next four years. Um, from September 21st to December 21st. And our affiliate has hosted many NCCC teams. We have um, kind of re-scoped how we're feeling uh, and how we're using NCCC. We used to bring them on during the winter. I'm just going to go ahead and change the slide here. That's a lot of information there if you guys are reading that, but that's kind of a little bit more about Habitat. I'm going to switch over. Um, yeah, so our affiliate has hosted in Triple C. We used to bring them on in the winter in Wyoming, um, especially in the Teton and Yellowstone region. We have extreme winters, and so we have very low volunteer participation during the winter months. So we used to bring in Triple C teams on at that point in time, um, but we have found that if we time our in Triple C teams better with the work, that we're able to get you know more effective this out of the team and keep our projects moving along. So in 2017, we began our largest project, which is building 24 homes in the town of Jackson um, over four years. And so we found that we need NCCC bad. <laughs> uh, we have a lot of work to do. And so we have really strict timelines on this project. We're doing eight homes every 16 months, and we need uh, help on top of our local workforce that we have. Um, so we, our project goals are just to complete these homes every 16 months, and NCCC definitely helps accelerate that and keep us on deadlines. So some of the benefits of having an NCCC team, um, these are just a few. Obviously, when you have 10 to 12 young people working five days a week, uh, that you can get a lot done, especially if they're motivated and they're geared up on the mission. and what, what you're doing with your organization. So 
We do a lot of initial training. Uh, we That's a super important thing, and I'll repeat that a lot. So um, initial training, spending the first couple weeks so that they understand the mission, so they understand the tools, they understand um, why they're there, the homeowner's connection to the project. So after a week or two on site, most of the members can serve as crew leaders. And so it's a leadership development opportunity for them, but also for us. So we're able to expand our capacity and uh, able to have more local volunteer force on site because we have these AmeriCorps leaders who are able to take local volunteers, they understand the tools, they understand the tasks that have been given, and they can um, you know, kind of take that and we can increase capacity on site. We also um, really, when, when volunteers have good experience with NCCC, they have a good insight into the AmeriCorps program, which just helps our organization and support of all aspects of our organization um, and national service programs and also getting their friends and family involved. I just think that it's really inspiring for our local community to see these young people dedicating a year or you know, 10, and a, 10 months of service, and I think that it really inspires our local volunteer force and makes them give back more. So it's a really positive thing for our for our local people to see that uh, NCCC is here, and you know they also really enjoy meeting people from all over the country. So it also NCCC promotes opportunities for leadership development on our staff and in our national service members, and also for the NCCC team themselves. Um, working with the NCCC team gives us an opportunity to evaluate our successes and challenges and make the improvements for the next incoming team. Like, for example, we used to house a team at a ranch way out in town um, that was about 12 miles away, and in my opinion, I thought, well, of course these young adults will like being out in the country, but we actually moved them halfway through their term to a spot closer in town and they gave us the feedback that they had more connection to Jackson and to Habitat for Humanity because they were closer and they were able to see that. So we definitely make um, you know, adjustments for the teams and um, do you know, listen to them as they are serving. So through their independent service projects and ISP, they've also brought a lot of community awareness to Habitat and just what we're doing in the community and what homes we're building. So the NCCC teams will go out and find independent service projects, whether it be at your local um, food bank or animal shelter. And by them going to those other organizations and saying, hey, we're here working with Habitat for Humanity, that has brought us a lot of awareness. So some of the challenges that we see, as you all can have heard, housing is a really big challenge. We are having a hard time housing our um, Habitat employees, our workforce, so thinking about housing 10 to 12 people is definitely a challenge, but it's something that we've been able to, um, to kind of work around. Like, um, we have worked with a couple different ranches. We've worked with real estate agents, and actually we are probably going to be putting this next team into Habitat homes that we just, we just repurchased a Habitat home, and I think we're going to be able to house the team there. So questions to think about when you're thinking about housing is where to house them and how much it's going to cost. And um, it's always a challenge, but you definitely, as an organization, you have advocates in the community. And I just started by asking questions. I started going to our real estate agents and saying, hey, what kind of resources do you think you could provide or who should I talk to about this? And it's really helped us um, you know, figure out those housing challenges. So food is another thing. <laughs> we've found that we're always thinking about how we can treat our team with food. And we've connected with a lot of local churches and local restaurants. We actually have one of the local restaurant owners he did an AmeriCorps program, so he's always really excited to provide the team with delicious food. And it's a really great way to treat them and to help them stay motivated. Also, just positioning in Triple C as leaders. Training is utmost important. We have an initial training protocol. So we, we first day that they come on site, they don't actually go to site. We do a learn to read a tape measure. What are We do an OSHA safety training. All sorts of, you know, you can, you think that um, 
everyone has used, maybe you think everyone has used a tape measure, but it's not necessarily always across the board that people know how to read that, those numbers. And so if we give them the tools and empower them at the beginning, then they're able to really develop themselves as leaders. And also safety for us is a huge thing. So we do um, competent person safety training, and it's really important that our NCCC team is staying on task and staying within our safety compliances because they are leaders on the site, and they are going to be teaching our volunteers, and we need to make sure that they are um, examples of safety. So I also, like with safety, I always say, as to my team, we have to lead by example. So we can't expect the NCCC team to have on hard hats if we don't have on hard hats. So we need to lead by example. We are leaders, and we're empowering them to be leaders. So some other challenges are weather. We have extreme weather. So having backup projects, we're lucky to have our restore really close, so we're able to kind of find some painting projects or things inside the restore in case of inclement weather. Um, also, just arranging with other organizations in the community to say, I like to call them before we have an NCCC team arriving and say, hey, I've got this group. If you have anything come up or you have any um, emergencies happen, feel free to reach out and we can always come, we can always come and help. You know, we, Habitat, can help you. We have tools. We have a team. Um, for example, two years ago, we had the senior center had a little bit of a, a water pipe problem, and we were able to send our volunteers, our tools, and our NCCC team to help just with them for a day of just some cleanup. So, you know, having backup plans and also just connecting with other people in the community who may have a need. Also, just team engagement is super important. There is a variety of ability and maturity among the core members, so being prepared to know that there might be some interpersonal conflicts going on. As Shashini said, there is, you know, they're living together 24-7. So there may be some things going on that you um, may not, you may not, you may have an insight to, but you may not understand. So I make sure to have um, personal relationships with each core member and be prepared to have these core members um, able to talk, talk through their problems. And we, kind of, we have a protocol that we go through if we do have any problems with the members of just like having one-on-one -on -one meetings, talking together as a team, getting everyone on the same page, and making sure that they feel connected and that they are, they are supported through us. So another great thing is kind of creating these, creating advocates for your organization. So they, we want to be prepared to provide the NCCC with a positive and meaningful experience. And we make sure to help them understand why affordable housing matters and teach the team about the areas of the community and why local people are struggling and connect them with our future home buyers. But in a sense, we are like training, you know, little, little habitat advocates. And they, they get excited. They, they're educated about what our mission is. And they're out in the community and they're talking about our mission and they're promoting why it's important. So I always make sure to provide the team with a lot of initial training and education so that we can create great little advocates. And we make sure that the um, AmeriCorps team, it's an example of our future home buyers in our education classes. And we um, make sure that they feel that we show them the appreciation for the work. Another thing is appreciating them and thanking them for their service. So our homeowners are really excited to see a team of young people come and helping them build their homes. So we make sure that the homeowners express that they're so grateful, and we make sure to express that we're so grateful for the team. Um, we take lots of photos. We share on social media. We invite them to tag us and follow us, and that just helps spread the network. Um, cause as you all know, young people are really good at social media. <laughs> and um, we introduce them to our community volunteers, recognize them in front of groups, and we ask them for their ideas and suggestions on how we can improve our program. So setting the stage is really important. So when you are thinking about hosting a team, um, you think about how we can announce that we're actually getting a team that's coming into the community. So we announce the award on social media. We inform our staff. We put it in our newsletters. We make sure that it's communicated that AmeriCorps is coming to town. And that really helps with the awareness when people see 
you know, 10 to 12 people walking down the street in uniform. So like, oh, that's that AmeriCorps team that Habitat got. So I also, with housing, I like to make their, arriving super, their arrival super special. So we make sure the housing is clean. We'll even like take volunteer day and um, clean it super nice, depending on where, where we've decided to house them, add little special treats, things like that. But it can just make the team feel really appreciated. Um, orientation and welcoming. So when the team arrives, we do uh, a nice icebreaker. They actually spend their first day with me on a tour to Jackson, as I call it. So we go around town. We see different things. I point out areas that may have interest to them, free parks, um, also maybe restaurants that they should definitely try while they're in the area. We go up to the Grand Teton National Park. We put together a pretty detailed orientation schedule and training and just make them feel welcome, feel that they can connect with me as their sponsor and know that and make sure that they know a lot about our area so that when people ask them questions of what are you doing here, they can be advocates and they can answer those questions about what's going on in Jackson and how they're playing a role to solve a problem. Um, so we also let them know at the beginning like what their weekly schedule is going to look like and expectations of the project. And then also I schedule a weekly check-in with the team leader just to make sure that we're all staying on the same page and that that, that person feels empowered to lead a team, but also I can help them in any way. You know, if it's, they need a few hours in the office, they can come in, use our printer, things like that. So team leader has a lot on their plate, so I always make sure to make make them know that they are supported by us as well. Um, and really prepare the team for like initial training. It goes a long way. So we spend the first week training, 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 training. And it, it seems maybe to them that they've already learned this. But in six weeks into the project, when they, they forgot the one thing that we learned in training, we can go back and say, hey, remember that day? Remember when we learned that? Um, and so I think the initial training protocol that we have started is has changed our teams a lot. Keeping on moving. So working as a team, super important. We do weekly check-ins with our team leader, as I said. And also, we invite the entire team to come into our staff meetings and to our construction meetings with the team leader, just so that the team leader is aware of the schedule, what's happening, are we having any delays, are we having any accelerations, just so that they can report back out to the team about what's happening as far as construction. Um, Having them in these meetings provides a lot of insight to the organization as well, and as well as professional development for them. So speaking in front of a group, we do an icebreaker at the beginning of all of our staff meetings and kind of talking about what struggles you're having in your work life or your personal life, and also seeing other people in their roles and understanding what people do for the organization and job opportunities that they may have after AmeriCorps. We also um, need to react and adjust to any challenges. So brainstorming with the team, working with the team leader, and um, adjusting to things that maybe happen. You know, there's you have a group of 10 to 12 young people who different things may be happening in their lives that aren't habitat construction. Um, so we make sure to connect with them and, and make them feel empowered. We also include team development activities through the service term, so making sure that the core members are connected in the community. Um, for example, we had a core member who was kind of interested in getting involved in some one of our churches, and we had a homeowner who was a pastor at a church, and they were able to like have one-on-one -on -one meetings and coffee, and he was able to kind of find his way through that. So it was a really cool experience to see a little personal connection from a core member to a homeowner. We also connect uh, with other AmeriCorps programs in the area. So we have a Teton Science School, which hosts a different type of AmeriCorps program. So we make sure that when we have a team here that we bring the Teton Science School AmeriCorps onto site, and we have a big build day with them, usually about 50 to 60 people. Um, we also like have fun with our team. So we we support them in having fun and include them in all of our hot, all of our potlucks and home celebrations and community events. And we also report back out, um, tell them what, how many hours they've given, give them reports on what the homeowners are doing, how, how they're doing in their um, sweat equity hours, things like that. Always make sure to loop the team in on that kind of data. 
so that they can track their impact a little bit better. And then celebrating, as I said, we like to have a lot of fun with our teams. Um, so this is the picture of when we did the tour to Jackson. So we took them to the Jackson Hole Mountain Resort, showed them the ski hill, gave them insight of what the ski community and what brings people to this beautiful place. Um, and during the last week, we make sure to set aside some time to go over some feedback. We do a celebration. We usually have a board member who will support and sponsor a fun activity for them, whether it be like snowboarding, skiing, winter tubing, going to a hot spring, something like that. So just to like really thank them um, and provide them with a little a cultural activity into our community. So we, we do a thank you uh, party at the end. So we write little personal hand notes to the team. We invite all of our homeowners, our board members, volunteers who may work alongside them. And we usually do a potluck style and then do games and stuff like that so that we can say thank you before they head off to their next project. And last but not least, we definitely debrief the team at the end, you know, what can we do as a sponsor to provide a better experience for them, and then actually taking that feedback and implementing change. That's, that's for me, been as a host site sponsor, asking them, what can I do to be better at my job? And they'll definitely give you feedback, and it's usually easy things that you can change. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much all I have. If anyone has any questions, um, this is a picture of me and one of our core members, Marcus, from a couple years ago. And we, it was a really muddy day, so we all painted ourselves with mud. So any questions that you may have, I'm happy to answer. And pass it back off to you, Jennifer. Awesome. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, mm -hmm. Wow, that was just all great information from both of our project sponsors. I can talk about teams all day, um, but there's nothing like hearing from people that have hosted teams and about the successes that they've had and the challenges and what it takes to host a team. I think um, a couple good points were made. And one is that the team can really act as a force multiplier. Uh, I love the idea of training them up as leaders, as many of our habitat sites do, but we've seen that in um, other organizations as well. And they, our team members, um, when they're properly trained, can manage other volunteers on the site, which just uh, turns out to be great big volunteer days and lots of work getting done for our organizations. We see that happen a lot in, during big events that organizations may hold as well. And the other thing is, is that this is just really a, a 360 degree benefit when you look at it. And I love hearing stories from sponsors because you just hear about the benefits to the organization, to the community, and then also to the team members that are out there doing the work. So um, it's, a, it's a great program uh, for all of those reasons. And I'm going to just take you through a few more slides here. Uh, there, there's a lot I want to look at, but what, what you're going to see is a, a couple of examples of what we're looking for on applications next, um, what it looks like for a successful application, and I just want to briefly show you a couple of the outputs from other projects that you we've had so that you can get a sense of the amount of work that can get done while you're hosting a team. So first of all, let's take a look at this is this is following our mission and also what's on the application. So what strong projects do is strengthen communities. That's a part of our mission. We are strengthening communities. So what you can do is that directly relates to your application is provide a well planned work plan for evaluate evaluative purposes, we want to make sure that there's 40 to 45 hours a week minimum for the team for each week that they're on the project. But also, the team has an opportunity to review those work plans before deploying. And what we're learning is that it's so much about preparation and mindset, and then being able to review the work plans and understand what's expected of them before they leave our campus um, really contributes to the success of projects. And so uh, what you want to do is make sure you're as detailed as possible in those work plans. Um, I'm just going to really quickly pull, pull up a work plan that we have here from a Habitat site so you can get an idea of what I'm talking about. And also, um, let me see how I can, I don't know, can, um, hey, Steve or Jeff, can you get this to um, open up correctly here on the screen for me? And I'll just keep talking about a couple other things while we do that. Um, and we provide the templates for work plans and training. 
Um, also, during the project planning, uh, just like Elizabeth was saying, alert the community that the team will arrive. So on orientation day, it's great to have a session where community is invited to meet the team, to learn about the team. And many times, then, what we see is that community organizations and churches create events um, such as potlucks throughout the term of service to involve the team in the community. Community integration is a uh, great part of projects that really helps the team not only understand what they're, the project that they're doing, but as, as well as the impact within the community and who they are serving. And finally, in inviting groups to work alongside the team is a great way to include the community. Um, we have a project at a habitat site. We have a couple habitat sites, actually, that work with at-risk youth on their habitat sites. And it, that um, ends up being a great way for them to be mentored by our members. So those are the ways that what we're looking at um, is directly pulled from our mission. And you'll see spots to enter that on the application. And then next, I guess this looks like this PDF is not going to not going to open correctly for us. Um, this is a little bit large for some reason. OK, there. OK, hey, we got it. All right, so it's kind of hard to see um, on here. But this is what a work plan looks like. And we send you the template for it. So basically, it's showing you the locations, the supervisors, the weekly check-in. Um, and then each day, what they're going to be doing and where they're going to be doing it. So you see here the welcome day. Then we have some safety training. If we jump down here, you see that they're working at the ReStore. Um, so each day is planned out for what they're going to be doing. And sometimes um, it gets even more detailed. But you see that they're doing pre-built cleanup. Um, and then they're laying the foundation later on. So it is, uh, there's details about what's going to happen each day. Of course, things may change. That's what your team leader is for, is to help you manage those changes. Um, to help you manage those changes, get them communicated to the team. And also, you're always welcome to send us updated plans um, after your project has been submitted so we can get those to the team before they deploy. All right, so let's take a look at the next piece that we have here um, of our mission, which is develop leaders. So strong projects are providing the team with the training to get the job done. They're utilizing service learning to get the job done. And really, what we mean by service learning is what I've been talking about, um, having the team understand the impact of their work on the community. and. Um, what is happening in community and what the organization is doing to address the needs of the community. So that's really what we mean by service learning. And then they also provide opportunities for development of life skills. So those weekly team leader meetings are something that we require of all of our sponsors. And we also appreciate when things like lunch and learns happen for the teams on the sites or different opportunities for them to participate in community discussions or learn from members of your team, because they are quite curious and really interested in their own development um, through other people. It's just such a big life learning experience for them to be out there on the road serving in your communities. So when your application comes in, this is what we are evaluating. Um, there are more pieces to it. But uh, th these are our main focal points, is we want to know what community need is being addressed and how the project that you have developed is addressing those needs. So that's in the project outcomes. Uh, your work plan, which I give you, gave you a little um, snapshot shot of. Um, an orientation and training plan. We also have templates for that. We'll send you when we send you the application to help you in developing those plans. Uh, member development, uh, so that is that service learning and that time that you're taking uh, to train the members as well as get them integrated into the community and any kind of lunch and learns or additional training that is vested in the members. And then the sustainability plan that Elizabeth talked about and I think she told me as well. Like what's going to happen after the team leaves? How are you going to carry forth the work that they have contributed? 
So of course, we're all here to help you throughout that process. Um, this is so this happened this year. On the left-hand side, that is the lot that our team pulled up to when they pulled up to a habitat site. And on the right-hand side is what they left after 12 weeks. So including the foundation being poured, they built and tried in a duplex. Within 12 weeks, they even got all of this drywall hung and the landscaping um, started as well. So it's really an impressive project for that team to get done in 12 weeks. And another thing I like to point out on this project, I went to visit and just having the team there to pour the foundation. Pouring foundation is not something that they would regularly have volunteers do. However, um, they had the team do it because they have them there for a long enough time that they can train them. And that, that saved um, the sponsor and the homeowner $12,000 just by having that team for the foundation. So really big impact. Here's our service timeline. Um, we have a concept form. And that is just making sure that your project qualifies and an opportunity for your assistant program director to give you any feedback on your concept before um, you receive the full application. So you see the column with the concept form and the application deadline, and those um, correspond to the service dates on the left. And I can that's in this RFA if you had a chance to download it. That information is right in that PDF that we have here for handouts and downloads, and I can send that after um, this webinar as well to everyone that attended. And here's our contact information. It's also on that PDF. Um, we're here to help you throughout that application project process. Um, we are really happy to help you in developing your project. Any questions that you may have about your project, your work plan, your training plan, we want you to be successful. So um, really, we're here to help guide you throughout the process. And you have access to uh, um, Sarah, Lindsay, and myself corresponding to your states uh, throughout the entire process. So really quickly, I just wanted to show you a couple of these outputs from other projects. This is Nogales, Arizona Community Development Center. They uh, had a project with bite attacks, and this is what was accomplished during it. Over a million dollars returned to the community. Um, over half a million of that was through the earned income tax credit. So pretty Can anybody hear me? This is Lindsay. Very well, Lindsay. We, we can hear you, Lynn. Perfect. Great. Well, then, sorry for the technical difficulty. Um, I will go ahead and close that up for Jennifer. Um, she was just covering some of the outputs that the team accomplished in Nogales. I'm sure you all had a chance to review those as we were trying to figure out the tech stuff. So we'll keep moving. Let's see. Yeah, so we also have some Habitat for Humanity outputs here. Um, I feel like Elizabeth covered some really good examples of this um, on their project. So for the sake of time, if everybody's OK with it, we'll keep cruising. Sorry about that. The slides are taking a second to change on my end.
Well, we might be stuck on the slide front as well. Um, I apologize for that. So um, I guess we'll just go ahead and close it up by letting everybody know. Um, first of all, we really appreciate you participating. We're always really excited to have some new folks here to learn about NCCC. Um, if you have any questions, um, we'll stay online for a few minutes. I'm happy to keep answering those in the Q&A box. Um, and you can also reach out to myself, um, Jennifer, or Sarah. Our contact information is in um, the handout that Jennifer mentioned, the request for applications. Um, you all should be able to download that from this webinar. And we will also follow up by email um, after the end of the webinar with some of the resources and things that we covered. So we really appreciate everybody being here. Um, and I hope everybody